Well, it is our third week in this series, Go. Go is kind of this miniature series that, uh, that I created because we were in the book of Acts talking about waiting on the promise, and that was the promise of the Holy Spirit that came in Acts chapter 2, and then uh, we're, we're going to move on to living in the power. But I thought, in between these two Acts series, let's, let's pause and take a break because what we're about to see is Peter stand up like the Holy Spirit has, has fallen and empowered for bold witness, the Jesus' followers. And now we're going to see Peter stand up and speak to the crowd. And then we see the church is born on that day. 3,000 people are added to their number. And then the church begins to expand out from Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's what the book of Acts is about. It's an exciting story. And it's all built on Jesus saying, you're going to be my witnesses. In a very similar passage at the very end of Matthew, we have what we call the Great Commission, which is go into all the world and make disciples. And him talking to his disciples, go and make other disciples. Baptize them in the name. Oh, here it is. So over the last few weeks, we talked two weeks ago about go uh, and how when we go that the great, to fulfill the Great Commission, living out the Great Commandment is critical that we love God and love people. And then last week we talked about making disciples and how we feel the weight of having to, to have people you know, change their heart and their opinion about God, but actually really a freeing reality that, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's what? The power of God. So we talked about making disciples that it's the gospel that does the work. We have to be faithful and just present it. And then today we're talking about baptizing. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Today we're talking about baptism because that's the other part of that sentence. And some of you are thinking, Hmm, I know about baptism. I was baptized a long time ago. I haven't really thought much about it since. And that's okay. Just stick with me. Because that might be a problem that we haven't thought much of it since. Since it was like, I've checked it off. I've done that. Uh, this message really is, is for not just people who have not been baptized, but for the people who've been in church for a long time. If you grew up in church especially, you might be like my kids, uh, so familiar with baptism that we don't necessarily uh, think through you know, I'll think a whole lot of it, but just really from, okay, let me tell you a story. A couple years ago, back when my kids weren't threatening to be taller than I was, than I am, back when I loved my kids, because they were small and I could control them, uh, a few years ago, I walked in on my kids with their chicken nuggets and their barbecue sauce or whatever they were dipping it in, and they were dipping their nuggets in the name of the Father and the Son <laughs> and the Holy Spirit. Now, I enjoy a good sacrilegious joke once in a while. <laughs> my name is Jerome Sack, so it kind of works that way, right? Um, I thought it was funny. My wife, on the other hand, she's more holy than I am, and she walks in, and she's like, guys, I would prefer that we not do that in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we, we have a ban on mick baptisms in our house, but uh, um, still really funny. But maybe that's like you. Like, I've been around baptism so long. I did it years ago. I haven't really thought much of it. So this is not just for those who have not been baptized, but... Yes, this is for those who have maybe never taken that step. Uh, let's talk about baptism. But, but here's where I want to do it, not just because I want to convince people to be baptized or, or remind us of the significance of baptism. We as a church called to make disciples, called to baptize those disciples, that's part of the Great Commission. And if we're on mission together to do the Great Commission, then we ought to have a shared theology of baptism. We ought to have a shared understanding of baptism because the beautiful thing about Radiant is we are a diverse church from diverse backgrounds and, and different traditions. And uh, what's funny is if you look at all the traditions in Christianity and all the backgrounds, you can see that like all the traditions value baptism, like really value baptism. But we don't all agree necessarily on when, how, when, why, when, did I say when already? Who? There is, there is, there is debate over those details so you can, so you can say with, within the whole of Christendom, there's not necessarily a shared view, but as a local church, we ought to have a shared theology of baptism. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at that today. And, and really, I think the biggest, and I've already hinted at it, the biggest challenge for me is kind of the apathy that we may feel towards baptism. If we've, if we've been baptized and it's been decades, we may not think much about it. It's for those new people. But if we are called to make disciples and to baptize them, then we ought to have a shared understanding of value and a hunger to see it happen in our church. Don't you want to see it happen in our church? That's right. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. We're actually going to go to the passage 
where, that we've been kind of looking at at the beginning of all the messages over the last few weeks. Matthew chapter 28, as you turn there, let me give you a little background. Matthew being one of the four Gospels, he writes with a Jewish audience in mind more than the other gospel writers. They all have their, 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 their differences in style and purpose and theme. And Matthew is definitely writing with a lot of references to the Old Testament and, and to fulfilling of prophecy and the prophets. Uh, and we're going to see a little bit of that as we look at Matthew today in a number of places. A little context as you turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 27 is the crucifixion. And then we get to verse 20, we get to chapter 28, verse 1, and it's Resurrection Sunday. We see Jesus is resurrected. And then what we read is his appearance to uh, his post resurrection appearances. Now, if you recall, we, if you've been with us, we just finished going through the book of John, and we saw Jesus show up in the upper room. The disciples were hiding, and we saw him leave, and Thomas heard about it and didn't believe. He comes back. We saw him a number of times. He makes breakfast for them. John has a beautiful, long description of post-resurrection Jesus. Matthew, just two stories. One of them is he, he appears to the women who showed up to the tomb and found it empty. They're going to go tell the disciples and Jesus appears to them. That's story number one, verses one through 10. But then we get to our passage today in verse 16 through 20, and he appears to his disciples in Galilee. Now, if you take a little peek at that first appearance to the women, he says, tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. So he goes and he meets them in Galilee. So, so J- Matthew absolutely fast forwards. Uh, I mean, he does cook, you know, what John gave us all these details about. Let's read Matthew chapter 28, starting in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. So in verse 16 through 17, we see kind of, and then Matthew's really condensing this thing compared to what John did, right? 16 through 17, we see that they're in Galilee, just like Jesus told them, the the women to tell them, he told them where to go in Galilee. And then we see this great commission. Can we put it back up there? I know I didn't put it in my notes to put it right there, but let's walk through that. Uh, Go, which we talked about last week, or two weeks ago. Make disciples, we talked about that last week. Baptizing them, the purpose of this message. The, the, the word here for baptizing comes from the Greek word baptizo, which is uh, which a word, which a word that means wash, to plunge, to soak. It's, it's go and baptizo them. Now, I, I, think, it, I think it needs to be said that um, the Bible was written in different languages. It was not written in English. Did you know that? Some people don't. That's okay. We're glad you're here. The Bible is written in Hebrew, a little bit Aramaic, and some Greek in the New Testament. And so Matthew's writing in Greek. Why? Because Greek is the dominant language of the time and in, in the world that they lived in. And so he's, but Jesus is probably speaking in Aramaic here, but, but, but Matthew hears go and, and wash, plunge, soak, and he doesn't, he says the word baptizo. It's the Greek word for wash, plunge, and soak. Now, biblical translators now going to English, as well as the disciples then, did not think that Jesus meant go wash, and soak, and plunge these new disciples. He said, go baptize them, and, and they knew Jesus meant something more. Now, the word baptizo, uh, you, you, it's used in Matthew about washing hands. Matthew chapter 7, where he's, uh, Matthew says that the Pharisees who didn't like Jesus they were so holy, they didn't eat anything until they washed their hands. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 11, doesn't wash his hands, makes the Pharisees upset. But here, it's not, it's not trans, that same word is translated differently, not wash or soak. The word is translated baptize. So let me ask you a question. Is that called translating? It's actually not. It's called transliteration. So you have translation, which is finding the equivalent word in one language for this word, and you have transliteration, which is, I'm going to carry this word baptizo, I'm just going to carry it over and kind of make it Americanized or Englishized or whatever. It wouldn't be Americanized, but it would be Great Britain, you know, King James English, baptized. Transliteration. So he, we just carry over a Greek word and we use it as part of our language. Why, why would we do that? Because we know that Jesus meant something greater than wash and plunge. 
Jesus' disciples remembered, and so does Matthew as he writes, and so does translators as they translate through the scripture, that, that Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist. In the very same book, Matthew chapter 4, you don't have to turn there. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus shows up, his cousin's down there on, on the riverbanks looking like a crazy man, and there's crowds gathered, and he's like, I want you to baptize me, and, and there's an exchange there. But, but John baptizes Jesus. John, by the way, the Baptist, wasn't because he went to a Baptist church. It's that same Greek word, baptizo, John the dipper, John the soaker, John the plunger. Uh, he plunges Jesus. What was John's baptism? It was a baptism of repentance. He was sitting there saying, hey, it's let me read it to you. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. We know John was like the forerunner of the Messiah. He was setting the, setting the table for Jesus to come on the scene. He's out in the wilderness essentially saying, it's not good enough for you to be Jewish and to be born in this thing. you got to turn to God. Repent of the way you're living and turn to God. Don't just amen it from the riverbanks, but get in the water and, and put your money where your mouth is. Baptism, back in the early part of Matthew with John the Baptist, was a baptism of repentance, a new start, a new identity. But let me ask this question. Where did John get this idea of baptism from? Did he invent it? Was he like, hmm, it would be really cool if I get people go underwater and come back out, kind of as a sign? No, he got it from the Old Testament, even though we don't see baptism like we know it in the Old Testament. He got it from the Old Testament, and he got it from the, the practice of the day of, of Judaism. You see, what happens in, in, in Judaism, by the time uh, we get to the first century and John is on the scene, uh, baptism is one of the things that you have to do to convert from being a, a Gentile, non-Jewish person to be a Jewish person. Let me give you uh, a couple of the, the requirements for uh, what's, what's called being a proselyte, proselytos, which is a, a word that's, uh, that means stranger or foreigner in the Old Testament. It's used in the New Testament to, to reference people who've converted to Judaism, right? Here, here are the things that are required of you if you want to convert to Judaism. Acknowledge the law. That makes sense, right? Acknowledge the Jewish law. Absolutely. Eat a covenant meal, kind of a symbolic meal of I'm, I'm, this is my, you know, my new tribe, that's the second requirement. The third requirement is circumcision, which means like it, you, you got to really want to be Jewish uh, if you're grown up saying, let's do this thing. Uh, anyways, if you don't know what that is, if you're children, yeah, anyway, circumcision is one of those things. I thought that would go over better than it, than it has, but uh, it's a pretty serious commitment. And if you know a little bit about the Bible in the Old Testament, you know circumcision is a big deal, so much so that in the New Testament, people are insisting that Christians become circumcised. That's why, because they thought, well, you're joining, you're following the Messiah of, you know. So that's why people want that to happen. But there was a time and a place, and perhaps even during this time, when even more important than circumcision in converting to Judaism was a ceremonial washing a ceremonial washing. So while, while we don't see baptism in the Old Testament, we do see ceremonial washing as being significant. Um, in Exodus, it was a symbolic act of purification. In Leviticus, Aaron had to wash himself before and after he entered to the Holy of Holies. It symbolized a, a, a cleansing and a new identity, uh, this ceremonial washing if you're converting to Judaism, becoming a proselyte Jew. So here we go. Let me back, to, let me back this up and we'll get back to Jesus. In Judaism... This washing was, hey, you, you want to join our, our, our tribe? You want to you be one of us? You got you to wash. You got to wash that Gentile dirtiness away, and you could be a proselyte Jew. John sees it and says, you know what? It's not enough to be a Jew. We're all sinners. We all need to repent, not just the Gentiles. And he's calling those people who are waiting for the Messiah to come to repent. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he's like, you know? So they're kind of just building off of each other. Jesus comes on the scene and says what? Repent and believe in the gospel. Then he tells his disciples, go out and spread the gospel, make disciples, and baptize them. So we're going to talk a little bit about baptizing, but the one thing I want you to get, if, if, you don't, if you've never been baptized or you're from a different tradition or background, um, this is kind of the theology of baptism here at Radiant, I guess. Uh, baptism is a public declaration of your personal decision to identify with Jesus. It's a public declaration of a personal decision to identify with Jesus. 
Like, I love the church of all stripes and colors. Um, I, I, I did not grow up in, I, I, I did grow up in, in this tradition, but I was born in a different tradition, and I was baptized as a kid, and it wasn't my personal decision. <laughs> uh, and if you were, so I, I want you to know that, like, I've been there, done that. I'm not judging anyone. I just want you to know that we believe in what's called believer's baptism. I'm a believer, therefore, I'm going to be baptized. This is my public sign. And some of you are saying, okay, Jerome, telling me something new. You've, you were right when you said, well, we've heard it all before, and uh, we haven't thought much about it. Let's talk about the early church first. What we're about to read when we go back to Acts is Peter standing up on the, on the day of Pentecost. And Peter, his message is, repent and be baptized. And 3,000 come to faith that day. And people are baptized from the moment the church began. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he calls people to be baptized. Baptism is pretty important to Peter. It's pretty important to the early church. As a matter of fact, uh, when we get to Acts chapter 8, and we're about 18 months from that, when we get to Acts chapter 8, that's a joke, by the way, we get to Acts chapter 8, we're going to see a guy named Philip. Now, who's Philip? In Acts chapter 6, uh, the, the, the apostles say, hey, you know, we need people who can help uh, serve tables, help uh, kind of like handle the money for the poor, taking care of people. Let's, let's come up with what, what we call deacons. We'll get there when we get to Acts chapter 6. But in Acts chapter, one of those guys is named Philip. And in Acts chapter 8, he becomes an evangelist, one of the first people to bring the gospel outside of Jerusalem. God tells them to go a certain way. Actually, let me read it to you, because what we see is Philip present the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, what's a eunuch? Ooh, there's a recurring theme to this message. Uh, a, 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 a eunuch is another step further. It's a, it's a, I don't even want to say this. It's a castrated man who's in charge of a harem or employed to guard the, women, the women's living quarters. So this guy's from Ethiopia. He's a eunuch. Uh, he's come to... to to this area. He wants to worship, and he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. Let me just read it to you. Acts chapter 8. As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and he met the treasurer of Ethiopia, a eunuch, a great authority under Kendake. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that. That's how Filipinos would pronounce it, and I was, I lived there for a while and learned that language. Uh, The queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, And he was now returning, seated in his carriage. He was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. Philip ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how do I, unless someone instructs me, and he asked Philip to come up into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he had been reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and he was a, a lamb, oh, And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. Now you're thinking like, what a great passage. That's like a a softball setup to talk about Jesus. Then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus as they rode along, they came to some... Okay, here we go. Verse 36. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? Now, let me ask you this question. What does the eunuch know about baptism? Obviously, somewhere in there, Philip described baptism. He explained baptism in his gospel presentation. I come here every Sunday... Most Sundays. I, most Sundays I'm here, and, and, and we talk about, if you're not a Christian, this is the message of the gospel. Have you ever t- heard me talk about baptism? Not, not, not in that context. But Philip feels like this needs to be one of the first things he hears about. This, we got to do this up front. He doesn't wait for, like, the advanced class. I think sometimes we wait for, like, this advanced, like, let's get him saved first. Baptism will be there later. But Philip does, he explains the gospel in one sitting, and the Ethiopian eunuch is listening, going, boom, there's some water, let's get out right now, I want to be baptized, I believe. This is very different than what Peter does on the day of Pentecost, where we hear him say the word baptism, but it's kind of inferred here, right? I mean, how else would the Ethiopian eunuch know? The fact that um, he points out, let's do this thing, and and they get out, and he baptizes them, and that story's crazy, We'll, we'll let you read that later. I think sometimes in the church, 
we kind of, I mean, maybe it's our, 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 our process of discipleship or, or Sunday school when we were a kid. We kind of learn like linear, right? A before B before C. And so therefore, B, baptism is B. So let's go A, get him saved, right? But if you look at the scripture, you see that baptism happens really, really early, almost indistinguishable from becoming a Christian. Peter did not wait. It was not an advanced subject. It was early on. I want to be careful in how I say this. Actually, I was standing, in, I was standing outside in the office area this morning, and Jordan walked in to get something out of his office, and I went, oh, and I'm just thinking at this moment, this is the moment I was stressing about. I want you to hear me on this. Um, biblically, the initial f- public profession of faith is baptism. So much so that I think I understand why certain traditions equate baptism as being a step that's necessary for salvation. Because in the Bible, I believe and I'm baptized, boom, you know, like there are churches that it's like you, you got to be baptized. That's one step to be saved. Um, we, we believe that like before you're ever baptized, like you cross, the, you cross a line of faith in your heart to even sign up to get baptized to say, yeah, I, I, want, I, want, I want to make a profession of faith. But in Scripture, it's almost indistinguishable. In the new, in, so what, what, what has happened in different traditions, including this one, th- this church comes out of a line of what, like, revivalist churches. Uh, and so somewhere along the way, along with other churches, we got into, like, bow your heads, close your eyes, raise your hand, come forward, repeat after me, right? That's what God used in my life, so I'm not bashing it. I, I'm just saying, I, I kind of feel like perhaps we, were, we, we wanted to get away from, like, sacramentalist pause. In a, in a little bit, we're going to receive communion together. Let me give you another example of this. Um, we're not transubstantiationists. We don't believe like the, 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 the grape juice and the little cracker turns into the body and blood physically of Jesus. It represents, it's symbolic. Because um, we, we didn't want to, like, we're, we're Protestants, right? We don't want to do that Catholic thing. So let me just call it out. But I, I wonder sometimes if we haven't swung the pendulum so far the other direction where our communion becomes token. Because I do think that there's a sacred moment to receiving communion together. There's something spiritual that happens. There's something that we encounter the Lord in that moment. Is it, is it transubstantiation? No. But is it just a, eh, it's a symbol. I think we lose something. I think we lose what Jesus intended it to be when it's just going through like a symbolic ritual. Somewhere in there, somewhere, we meet God when we receive that. Not a sacramentalist, but there's something sacred that happens in that moment. I would say the same is true of baptism. But I fear that maybe we've, we've swung the, the pendulum so far away from you must be baptized to get saved, which we don't, we don't, we don't believe. You have to be a, 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 someone who believes and makes a decision to be baptized to show your faith. It's an evidence of salvation, not a condition of salvation. But maybe we've swung the pendulum so far that it's like, eh, You've prayed the prayer, you raised your hand, we all clapped for you, we, gave, we said congratulations, welcome to the family of God, and we'll get to baptism when we get it on the schedule. I'm just trying to figure out as I read scripture, like, is what, what, did, what, did, what was intended for baptism? I think it's supposed to be really up front and early. I think it's one of those things where there was no altar call in the book of Acts. There was no raise your hand in the book of Acts. There was no repeat after me prayer, there was people who came to faith, they confessed, they repented, they believed, and they said, I want to be baptized, and I want to show everybody that I believe and I identify with Jesus. Now, will we still have people pray, repeat after us? Sure. Will we ask people to raise their hands? Perhaps. My point is, ooh, could we have possibly, let me ask this question. When somebody prays to receive Jesus in their heart, you know, I prayed to receive Jesus, at what moment does it come into this heart? When you say amen or come into my heart? Like, I almost feel like we said, well, this is not good. This is, you know, a condition for salvation. But then we've said, well, repeat after me. This prayer now has become our new condition for salvation. What happens if someone comes down the aisle to pray the prayer and then collapses? And isn't, Are they going to be in heaven? I think so. 
just like you can be in heaven if you believe in Jesus and call on him to be your Lord and Savior and are never baptized. What happens is there's a line in our heart where we cross the line of faith, where we repent, we recognize who we are, we recognize that we are separated from God, and there's nothing we can do to make ourselves right with him, but that Jesus Christ lived a life that we couldn't live and died a death that we deserve, and we put our trust in him. And baptizing and getting baptized would be that evidence. Let me show you. We've just gotten away from it with, for other reasons in uh, recent church history. I'm not trying to change church history. I'm just saying this is my thoughts, and I, and I struggle with it because I, I feel like we've, we got rid of one obstacle and maybe created another one. Does that, does that make sense to you? Man, we just crossed the line of faith. I'll be honest with you, when I talk about a shared understanding or a theology of baptism, I struggle within my own self. Like, Jerome, are you leading this church with baptism being as elevated, as important as it should be? Baptism, um, not only is it just a public sign. I mean, think about it, guys. Oh, wow. Okay, look at this. Baptism, public profession of faith, public declaration of a personal decision, what better sign to tell everybody that I'm a believer in Jesus, that I identify with him, than baptism? I think it's far better than walking to the front of this, to the stage and raising your hand or praying a prayer because baptism in itself illustrates what is taking place spiritually. It's a God-given object lesson that illustrates the good news about new life. Paul put it this way in Romans chapter 6. Now, he's talking about our relationship with sin as, as, as a Christian, but, but, but in the course of that, he describes um, the picture that is painted in baptism. Let me read it, Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Well then, should we, si should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his, uh, of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since you have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and we were buried with Christ by baptism. So we tell baptism candidates, like, when we put you under the water, like, this is like, Going in the tomb with Jesus, it's dying to yourself. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we've been united with his death, we also will be, coming out of the water, raised to new life as he was. You thought I just wanted to wear a t-shirt today. I wore a t-shirt with a purpose. There is a being raised to new life that takes place in our life, and baptism symbolizes that and is... It, 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 Man, baptism is the gospel in three dimension, right? It's, it's an object lesson. Paul continues, We know that our sinful selves were crucified with Christ and that sin might lose its power in our lives. By the way, this is another sermon, and I love this passage. If you've ever been on a men's walk with me, you know I love this passage. For we, for we died with Christ when we were set free from the power of sin, and since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you and I should also consider yourselves. So you should also consider yourselves being dead to sin, dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. There's a, a, a Bible scholar, professor uh, that wrote this. Baptism is, not, baptism is not something other than the gospel. It is the gospel in three-dimensional form the experience and assurance of which we live for the rest of our lives. So shared understanding, who's it for? It's for those who put their trust in Jesus. When do we do it? Pretty early on, it seems. Shortly after coming to faith. Biblically, it seems it's almost immediately, almost, you can't tell the difference. And like I said, there's a lot of grace for people who think, well, maybe it's a condition. It's not a condition but it happens as, because that was the public profession. It was the way that you said, I am a Christian. Baptism is a public declaration of your personal decision to identify with Jesus. So what do we do with that? And here's where the application comes for those of us who've been in church for a long time or those of us who've maybe never been baptized. If you've never been baptized and you put your faith in Jesus, I would encourage you to be baptized. It's the first biblical step after salvation. 
you may have taken a lot of other steps. Maybe you've been a Christian for a very long time. It's not too late. It's still that first biblical step. And the way we do it in 2022 is certainly different than the early church did it. I've already acknowledged that, but it's still a powerful witness of what God has done in your life, a public declaration of your decision that is personal, that you choose. But it's a decision that shows the world what, what God has already done in you, what is already true of you. Like I said, it's not a requirement or condition. It's an evidence of salvation, symbolizing the new life like Paul speaks about that you live, that you go under the water, you, your old life is dying, you're dying to yourself, and you're raised to new life in Christ. You're no longer, and what Paul says, one of my favorite verses, like, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Like, my life is not my own. You have a new identity in Christ because of what he's done for you on the cross, a sacred moment, not just a, not just a, a token moment, a symbol, not just a, a ritual that shows, that represents something, but an actually sacred moment, a powerful God moment. I mean, you see people coming out of the water and they're like, whew, like worshiping. I, uh, I encourage you to, to get baptized. Now, now, now let me give you the way to do it. Um, we actually are going to do a baptism service. And it might not actually be the service. On September 18th, uh, September 18th, mark your calendar, just about a month and a little change away, uh, we're going to have our fall picnic that same day. And we're going to either do a baptism service here with the baptismal there, or maybe we just do, sur just do church and we'll go outside, have a picnic, and baptize people out there, which I think would be really cool. We could just gather around and watch people, bapt watch people be baptized, hear their testimony, um, a lot of that depends on the weather. But if you're interested in being baptized, if you would like to make that step, that public profession, I, here's what you do. Text the word RADIANT to 317-676-2040. It's that same landing page we talked about when we talked about offering. Or you can visit this website uh, on, in a browser. But why would you type this into a browser when you could just text something and get a link sent back to you? Let us know, and we'll, we'll get in communication with you. We'll give you, we'll give you the, 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 the details of the day, like, you will receive a free T-shirt just like this. You know, those type of details. We don't need to tell everyone else those details, but if you'd like to be baptized, if you'd like to talk to someone about baptism, do that, and we'll reach out. It's probably necessary here, as it is all the times when we talk about baptism, is to address the children side of things. Um, if you're a parent and you like to see your child baptized, we all want to see our children baptized. We want to see them profess their faith in Christ. Uh, the Bible is not really clear. It doesn't lay out a whole lot of uh, details for when the church is supposed to determine when a child should be baptized, when it's an appropriate time to do it. So I sat down with Pastor Angela uh, and we said, let's talk about this because it's going to happen here at Radiant. And we've baptized children here, here is kind of like the, the, our thought process. First of all, parents must be involved. So if your kid comes up to us and says, I want to get baptized, we're not going to do a thing until we hear from a parent and says, yeah, they're ready. Parents, you have the number one priority and responsibility to, to invest faith into your child so you'll know when they're ready. At the same time, we're going we're gonna, to you know, have a conversation with the appropriate staff member, whether that's Pastor Josh with youth or Pastor Angela with kids. And so just thinking through children, being a parent, and she's a parent, um, it's not, a, it's not a, a hard, fast rule, but I think we would recommend about age 10. Does that make sense? Uh, my son, Ben, is going to be baptized this next round. And guess what? He's age 10. Just a coincidence. Uh, <laughs> but age 10 is, about, is, is a good time to really say, like, I know what I believe, Mom and Dad. I, I want to do this. What I would say, secondly, for those of you who... Ha have already been baptized, you call Radiant your home, you're part of this local congregation, is be here. Be here. It's a privilege to rejoice with what God has done in someone's life. But being here is so much more than just witnessing it. I think that being here when someone is baptized and proclaims their faith makes us active participants. You see, we receive those who are being baptized because someone's coming out of the water saying, I have new life in Christ. I identify with him and therefore I identify with his church. That's us. This person is coming out of the water saying, I identify with all of you. And I want us to be there saying, we identify with you. Not just welcome, but we are committed to you. 
We are committed to you to do the very next verse in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Teach these new disciples to obey all that I have given you. Be here. Mark your calendars, September 18th, fall picnic. And finally, and this is, I'll be really brief about this because it's really not in the text, but just going through this, I think it needs to be said for those of us who've been in this thing a long time, stay, stay public, keep this thing public. Baptism is meant to be the initial declaration of our faith, not our only declaration of our faith. We are called to live a life for the sake of the world. I'm not a fan of the fact that I've been the pastor here for three and a half years and we've done two baptism services. And I was sleeping in an airport and missed one of them. And I want to celebrate as a congregation, hear testimonies of what God has done in people's lives. Could you imagine how this change, the, the atmosphere in the church can change on mission, making disciples and disciples standing up saying, I identify with Jesus. I am raised to new life. He's called me to him and he's called me to you. I suspect the more that happens, the more we want to see it happen. It fuels our mission to go and make disciples and celebrate what, what God has done for us. Ultimately, to celebrate what Jesus has done for us. At this time, we're going to receive communion together. If you walked in and happened to miss uh, the elements, they're there at the tables in the back. I'm going to give you a moment to Stand up and get those. By the way, as you do that, a couple weeks ago I was sitting in my office early on a Sunday morning, and for some reason, that song we sang, the second song we sang today, came. I guess I had, I was looking up a certain song that we were singing because I wanted to make sure I knew the words and when to come up here and all that other stuff. And then that song was over and I just left it running and, it, and, and another song came in, which was that Leaning on the Everlasting Arm song, which is a beautiful, like, updated version of a, an old classic. Uh, and fell in love with the song, sent it to my wife and to Jordan as a, by the way, this is a cool song, not a, I command you as the Pope of Radiant to make this thing happen. <laughs> And they made it happen within a matter of a few weeks, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so I asked them, they were going to sing a different song. We're going to receive communion together. They're going to sing a different song. And I said, no, no. I, actually, I was in the front row sending a message that can we sing, can we close with this song? You think about the words of that song that I'm, I'm leaning on him. I'm leaning on what Christ has accomplished on the cross. And there, I'll be honest with you, when I first heard the lines, the more I'm dying, or the more I'm leaning on Jesus, the more I'm flying and I feel less like dying, which I'm like, well, that seems weird. People are going to hate that line. But then I thought, when do we really find life? When we die. When we lean on him. We die to self. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, for those who aren't Christians, the thought of dying to self doesn't sound doesn't sound great, doesn't sound attractive. But for those of us who know, we know that we really truly find life when we die. We find life in him. And that's what we're celebrating. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Let me read you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At this time, if you want to uh, open that, and we're going to pray. And the band's going to come, and I pray, and we're going to uh, take this together. Father, we thank you for the broken body of Jesus. This bread represents just that very thing. God in the flesh, the Logos, the, the word that was there at creation. 
how humiliating it is for God to take on flesh, to walk amongst his creation. And yet, because of your great love for us, that very thing happened. The Father sent the Son. The Son takes on flesh. And upon that cross, in our place, takes our penalty. Father, I pray that as we take this, that we will remember that sacrifice. From the very moment of incarnation, there is sacrifice all the way to the cross. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Would you eat the bread with me? In the same way, he took the cup. He said, this represents the blood, the blood of Jesus. And every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we pronounce his death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. Just like the old song says, it washes away our sins white as snow. Nothing we can do can clean ourselves up. We recognize, Lord, again, as we did the moment we came to faith, that we desperately need you. We thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice we shed blood of Jesus. As we take this, we remember. In Jesus' name, would you take it with me?